Jessica Apple is a writer and editor with a focus on metabolic health and a co-founder of a nonprofit magazine for low-carb diabetes. Please welcome Jessica Apple. Good. Hi. I'm Jess Apple. It's an honor to be here. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for listening to my story. This is not medical advice. When I was in kindergarten, my mom wore a black eye patch, like a pirate. She had a cane to help her walk, but her arm shook so much she couldn't really hold the cane down on the floor. She had a disease that was hard to say and impossible to spell. Mommy's body is attacking itself, my dad explained. No one knew why. There wasn't a single day in my childhood when I didn't wonder what would make a body attack itself. And I was still thinking about it when it started happening to me. I got chicken pox when I was 25. I was sick for weeks and even when the pox went away, I still didn't feel good. But my doctor couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. I can't prove it, but I think that that's when my autoimmune problems began. It, as is sometimes the case, there isn't a clear diagnosis. It was concluded that my illness was in my head. And okay, fair enough, because I was incredibly anxious. I was in my mid-20s, the same age my mom had been when she got sick. And what I remembered from my childhood was when you get sick and nobody knows why, you go on to endure unthinkable suffering for more than a decade, and then you die. But that's not what happened to me, quite the opposite. I got pregnant, and then, for the first time, I had an oral glucose tolerance test, and I found out that I had gestational diabetes. My doctor was really surprised because I was young and thin, and healthy because I ate according to the food pyramid. Lots and lots of healthy, heart-healthy grains, low-fat dairy, plenty of fruits and vegetables, and I didn't eat meat because, it wasn't because I thought meat was bad for me, I just didn't want to eat animals, and I had been a vegetarian for most of my life. It would take eight years and two more pregnancies for me to finally figure out my diabetes problem. Strangely enough, during that time, my husband, Mike, was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, autoimmune diabetes. And once again, my loved one's body was attacking itself. And though more than 20 years had passed since my mom was sick, still no one could explain what would make a body attack itself. Mike's diabetes symptoms were severe and scary, and he almost died before he got the correct diagnosis. But me, on the contrary, there was nothing dramatic about my diabetes. I always presented with slightly elevated fasting glucose, and my doctors weren't concerned about it because my grandfather had had type 2 diabetes, so it was genetic. And genetic obviously meant inevitable. I was presented with the notion that my health was predetermined and that I was doomed to be sick. My anxiety about that impending doom and pretty much everything else was tremendous. I carried it with me everywhere like a heavy backpack that I could never put down. At the end of 2008, halfway through my third pregnancy and convinced that I had something more than gestational diabetes, I asked a doctor to test me for type 1. I was diagnosed with LADA, latent autoimmune diabetes in adults, based on autoantibodies and low C-peptide, which indicated a diminished capacity to secrete insulin. LADA is a slow-progressing form of type 1, and it usually comes with insulin resistance. It looks a lot like type 2, or metabolic syndrome, in its early stages, and it's often called type 1 and a half. After my diagnosis, a dietitian gave me a meal plan. 
She sat at a desk in front of a poster of the food pyramid, and she had a lot to say about my need for fiber, particularly in the form of bran flakes. I tried to follow her instructions for a few days, and I, I ate bran flakes for breakfast, but my blood sugar was never under 180 afterwards, so how could they be good for me? At my second appointment, with tears in my eyes, I explained that I couldn't eat bran flakes without a giant spike in blood sugar, and it never happened to me when I ate eggs. The dietitian assured me that the problem was not the cereal. It was me. That's why you take insulin, she explained, to bring your blood sugar down. But why would I want to take a giant bolus of a really dangerous drug when I could just not eat bran flakes? They don't even taste good. It defied common sense. And though I trusted in my common sense, I also knew that what made sense to me was not the same thing as scientific evidence. So I was confused and I was scared. Doctors promised me that Lotto would worsen with time and there was nothing I could do about it. Recognizing that they might be right and I might be making a big mistake, I still opted to go with my common sense and I became a scientist of myself. And I said goodbye to insulin and off I went with my little glucose meter in a big dream to have agency over my health. <laughs> Thank you. I diligently tracked my blood sugar before and after meals, and I figured out what I could metabolize without needing to inject insulin. I didn't know it at the time, but I had essentially begun a ketogenic diet. At that time, Aside from the groundbreaking work of Gary Taubes, there wasn't a lot of information about carbohydrate restriction, and certainly not from the American Diabetes Association or anyone in the diabetes industry. They were pushing the message that carbs were essential and that diabetes was a genetic misfortune which had nothing to do with what you ate, unless you ate a lot of red meat, and then that was the problem. Still today, you can find terrible advice on their website. Today, they're telling you that fruit juice is a nutritious choice, but fruit juice is sugar. Mike and I decided to tell the world there was another way to manage diabetes, and that a life without carbs could still be very sweet. In 2009, we founded A Sweet Life, a nonprofit low-carb diabetes magazine. And for over 12 years, we published thousands of articles about metabolic health and diabetes. At the same time, Mike was running marathons, and I was quietly treating Lada with diet and exercise only. What I could not tell you when I started this in 2009, I can confidently tell you today. There is at least one person on this planet who has put Lada into remission for 15 years. Guess who? And along the way, I've spent a lot of time contemplating the origins of autoimmune diseases. Because inside me has always been the little girl who watched her mother deteriorate into a body that could do nothing but breathe. And I wanted to know what happened to her. But even more importantly, as a mother myself, I had to know what I could do to protect my children from disease. So I thought a lot about LADA and how it straddled the line between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. What was the connection between metabolic dysfunction and autoimmune disorders? Was insulin resistance a trigger for autoimmunity? Or did autoimmunity cause insulin resistance? Had my keto diet put LADA into remission? And could we start looking at all autoimmunity through a metabolic lens? I had a million questions. And over the course of a few years, metabolic health became a hot topic. And it was very exciting. Wonderful things began to happen. My brother, Sam Apple, 
published a book called Ravenous about cancer as a metabolic disease. A group called the Type 1 Grit publicly proved that children with diabetes could grow and thrive on a low-carb diet according to Dr. Bernstein's method. My friend, Dr. Mariella Glant, an endocrinologist, started to treat her diabetes patients with keto. And a medical doctor with MS, Dr. Terry Walls, recovered from MS using nutritional therapy. And she, she went from a wheelchair to riding a bike. She was the first person I heard talk about mitochondrial dysfunction in MS. I knew that mitochondria were the cells that powered metabolism. So mitochondria and metabolism, something was clicking for me. Something was starting to make sense. And so many of the metabolic mysteries I've been wondering about were starting to unravel. And critical for my self-sciencing was the work of Harvard psychiatrist, Dr. Chris Palmer, who says, all symptoms of mental disorders can be tied directly to metabolism, or more specifically, mitochondria. Just like Dr. Walls had identified mitochondrial dysfunction in MS, Dr. Palmer, or impaired mitochondrial biology, as Dr. Matthew Phillips calls it, Dr. Palmer's brain energy theory claims that this is also the root cause of all mental disorders, impaired mitochondrial biology. What could we possibly do about that? Actually, there's great news because there's so much we can do. And I was already using one of the metabolic strategies, a ketogenic diet. But by the time I learned about keto for mental health, I'd been on a keto diet for so long, and it was great for my blood sugar, but I'd never felt any relief from my anxiety disorder. So I shrugged it off because, you know, nothing works for everyone. But at the same time, I knew that my diet was deficient in nutrients because I didn't eat meat. And I had long believed that the science shows that animal fat is essential for the brain to, op to work optimally. Except that not eating meat was also central to my moral identity, and it wasn't something that I wanted to overcome. So I had to work really, really hard on myself to change, and I constantly reminded myself that I am an animal with biological needs. Just own it, I'd say to myself, until finally I did. I stopped using plant fats, and I replaced them with beef tallow. And my brain transformed. Within a few weeks, my heavy backpack of anxiety turned into a handbag, and the incessant voice in my head telling me to brace for impending disaster went from a scream to a whisper. I had finally found a way to be in the moment without the background noise of fearing what comes next. This is just anecdotal, of course. I don't know if or for how long any of my health improvements will last, and I'm really not qualified to tell anyone what they should or should not eat. So I'll quote someone who is, Dr. Terry Walls. Eat for your mitochondria, she says in her famous lecture about recovering from MS. Become ambassadors for your mitochondria. Dr. Walls rose up from a wheelchair doing this. My friend, Hannah Warren, put bipolar disorder into complete remission doing this. You just heard what I did. And there are thousands of others, including many of you here today, who are healing using metabolic strategies. And I'm so grateful to be part of this community. We are demonstrating what is possible, propelling science forward and paving the way for a new approach to preventing and managing chronic illnesses. Thank you. Thank you.
I just wanted to add, uh, I only found this out backstage. She flew all the way from Tel Aviv to come give that speech. Yeah.